Really, really happy uh, to have Trevor Witt here today, making him drive all the way over from Salina and K-State Polytechnic. Uh, fortunately, he's got some other work to do here on the Manhattan campus today. Uh, but Trevor, as I said, is from uh, K-State Polytechnic, and more specifically, the Applied Aviation Research Center. And uh, I'm familiar with Trevor with his work on unmanned vehicles, and I thought what an interest, what, that would just be a really interesting talk. Uh, for this group, given the applications in natural resources and just what an active area of research and applications that is. So, I'll be quiet and turn it over to Trevor Witt. Perfect. Well, thanks for the introduction. And yeah, so um, I'm just going to give a real general talk today. I'm usually pretty informal with my presentation. So, if you guys have questions uh, that come up, go ahead and uh, get a hold of me and We'll go ahead and answer them. This presentation is for you guys. So hopefully by the end of once uh, 1220 rolls around, you guys will walk away with a little bit more knowledge about unmanned aircraft and their different applications. So really briefly, just about me, I graduated K-State Polytechnic in December. Um, how many, does everybody know that K-State Polytechnic exists in here? Okay. I think they're getting a lot better about uh, broadcasting their name. They're for a while. I said that I was going there. They're like, K-State has another campus? But, but yeah, um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in unmanned aircraft systems operations. Um, and ever since um, my freshman year working there, I was a student worker on the research side of things. So I focused on the data side, map making, data analysis, how to collect good data with these types of platforms. So I've been working with that for about four years. December rolled around and they gave me a um, a full-time job. So I've been able to work on projects ranging from all those different people and more. Um, it's funny, back to graduation, I, I had one week, just to give a little personal story, one week on Wednesday my son was born, uh, Asher, over there, and then on Friday I graduated college. So literally two hours after we left the hospital, um, I was walking across the stage. So it was, it was a very busy week. Um, but overall, um, I'm a, I like to say I'm a generalist or expert generalist, even if that is a thing. Um, I just like when technology is applied to areas that just make sense, where it saves money, where it saves lives, and that's just really fun. And that's where unmanned aircraft fit in for a lot of different things. Um, brief uh, little history about the Applied Aviation Research Center. We've been around um, since 2008. A lot has happened since then. Uh, biggest thing for this year is that we're actually becoming a partner along with uh, one of the national test sites uh, that's uh, led by the University of, La of Alaska. Um, but that's gonna allow us to keep doing even more fun things uh, with unmanned aircraft. So uh, we're kind of split up uh, the U whole UAS program, even though there isn't technically a program, but that's what everybody calls it. Uh, the ARC fits under those first three, research, flight ops, and training, and maintenance and technology, and then there's the curriculum academic side. So all the academics are hosted mostly over um, on the Polytech campus, but there is a UAS minor that's in the works, and maybe someday I'll get a master's degree and be able to come over here and help teach that. Um, but mostly what I work under is those first two in the research and flight ops side. So what makes our program, a lot of fun, is we actually go out and fly. We actually go out and do a lot of different stuff. Um, ranging, we have a wide variety of different platforms in our lab, ranging from a small, this is our smallest platform, a little DJI Mavic, if any of you have seen one of these, um, all the way up to the one sitting there on the launcher right there that has a 13-foot wingspan, can fly for about five hours, um, launches off of a pneumatic catapult. It's really fun to be able to be that person to press that button. Because um, uh, on a runway, okay. yeah, the newest model um, actually lands via parachute, so it just stalls, deploys a parachute, and then has little airbags that puff out. That's a lot. Um, that's actually a lot less nerve-wracking way to land the thing because you get something like that flying at 45 miles an hour down a runway, and uh, it can get a little squirrely pretty quick. But. Um, one of the things that we do offer that's ever expanding is our flight ops and training side of things. So uh, people are getting really excited about all the different applications of drones. Um, 
So we actually offer a Part 107 training course that some of you may have heard of. Um, helps you prepare you for, we probably give you more information than you need, but we actually give you enough to where after you go and pass the FAA's exam, you're actually able to go out and start applying the technology. Um, and that is a cool little debrief of all the different people we've had. We've had about 100 people go through our exam um, program and wide variety of different um, sectors and all that. I actually, and then we offer other uh, training courses. I focus on, I help out with the part 107 as needed, but um, I mainly focus on this data processing and training one. I've been able to do that two times. And last time around, I had a sheriff, a guy from the USDA, and two people from KU and the KU geography department. So it was funny, it was my first fall semester not going to school. And I was teaching a class, teaching a professor that has like 40 years of experience. That was a cool little turn of the tables. Um, so to get down to it, uh, drones are absolutely everywhere. They're crashing on the White House lawn. Uh, they're flying over. I, over Labor Day weekend, I was out on the lake and uh, saw some people out flying there off of their boat. They're absolutely everywhere. So. Uh, it's funny how the technology can just kind of explode like that. So I'd like to well, debrief a little bit. But first, one of the things that I like to cover in every one of my term, uh, every one of my presentations is talking about terminology. I've said drones, and I'm starting to get more comfortable with that term. But when I first started in 2013, drone typically meant something like this: a predator flying in Afghanistan, shooting missiles and stuff like that. That was people's association, and it's been cool over the past four years where now you say drone. And it's like a little mix of that, and then it's mostly this, because this is what's on the news more than those. So uh, the merging of a different, and the word drone actually originates from the male honeybee that doesn't do any work. So it's funny how we get from there to like this highly sophisticated flying computer as like a drone, but anyways. When, so I like to compare it to something else. So does anybody know what this is? Corn. Yeah, corn. What about this? Yep. And there? But what if I said it was all grass? Because it is all grass. It's just a generic term for it. So that's kind of how I think of the word drone. Drone is kind of like a nickname, generic. It applies to a lot of different things. But if we want to get specific about what I do and how the technology is actually applied, um, that's where we use the term unmanned aircraft system. And that can range even widely as well from things like um, the Global Hawk, which our executive director was actually a uh, FLUOS in the Air Force, um, has a wingspan of a 737, so absolutely massive aircraft. Um, to something that you can fit over your shoulder, like the Scan Eagle over there, they use those a ton um, overseas, and all the way to something as small as a honeymoon bird that can fit in your hand. Uh, unmanned aircraft system can range from all those. And mostly what I work with is small unmanned aircraft, and that's anything 55 pounds and below. I don't know where that 55 pounds came from, probably somewhere in the military, they set on that, and like, that sounds like a good number, and any small UAS is that and below. And that's where part 107, or the regulations that enable you to fly these systems commercially, is anything 55 pounds and below. Um, and then UAS is pretty much everything else, to, uh, ranging from those wide variety of different sizes like I talked about. So why do we call it a system? It's comprised of an actual air vehicle, uh, so something that's up there flying, what somebody would typically call just the drone, uh, has to have a ground control station or some means of controlling that aircraft. And then you have to have some sort of data link to communicate with it. So I was talking a little bit before this presentation is a lot has to go right to make this technology work. And one of, I guess, the things that I have to overcome almost daily working with this technology is troubleshooting and figuring out how to make it work when it breaks or when one little thing goes wrong that's never gone wrong before and you're doing a flight demo in front of 50 people and you gotta figure out how to make it work, that's this technology all the time. And then how did we get to the point where 
You can buy something like this for $1,000 off Amazon where it has obstacle avoidance technology on it, a 4K camera that's gimbal stabilized um, and packs up into a bag that um, is small enough to where you could probably put it on your carry-on inside something like that. So how do we get here? Well, started a lot with military stuff. A lot of the cool technology that we get to use in our daily lives starts in the military. Um, also, RC hobbyists, they've been really good at miniaturizing a large aircraft technology ever since um, large aircraft have been around. Ever since we started flying things, hobbyists have been around um, helping to miniaturize the technology. But then the biggest one is what everybody has on their desks or in their pockets right now is cell phones. The little sensors and all the miniaturized computer boards uh, that are mass produced in cell phones are what helps get the technology cheap to be able to fit it in a little aircraft like this. So all this working together is what's made really the past four years, four or five years, help the consumer application and the consumer side of drones really take off. So to get to uh, the applications and limitations, um, just real broadly to start out with, uh, one thing that I like to say is you name any industry and you will find that probably UAS or drones will be a useful tool for that industry. And we'll kind of, I'll hit some high level ones uh, throughout this presentation, but I'm sure you guys have thought of other ones and seen other ones out, out being used. But to get back to the military side of things, where it comes from, why robots, probably yeah, just robots in general are used, it's a dull, dirty, dangerous side of things. So where if it's boring for somebody to do it, um, if it's some sort of yeah, uncomfortable situation for a pilot to do it, dangerous, where that, those three all fit together is like when uh, the Fukushima reactor um, melted down. They sent, uh, I think, like 20 different uh, unmanned aircraft into there to do inspections. And they just left them there um, because they were already so heavily contaminated. But it helped them get an idea of what was going on without any risk to a person. And then one new thing in a presentation I heard is the dollar side of things. These things can help save a ton of money, and you're seeing that in a lot of different indus industries. Uh, but what <laughs> still has to be done um, to really make uh, those four uh, Ds work out really well is the problems that are being solved here is making these things more autonomous, um, having them fly together in cooperation, and then also being able to fly them beyond where you can see them. And there's all sorts of limitations that are inhibiting those, but that people are pushing through right now to get to. And some of the cool videos I'll be able to show will demonstrate uh, those enabling cases. So uh, take a little break from me talking. I'll get to my first little video. Just because, and this will, this isn't related to so far what I talked about, other than it is an application of unmanned aircraft and a K-State grad was involved with this. Um, this one. really where the drone side of things comes from with this technology is these started being called drones back in the 60s and 70s when they're flying main aircraft size ones, dropping them off a bomber, they were just gliding through and fighter pilots were able to do target practice on them. So uh, K-State grad and one of my good friends actually works for the company that makes these target uh, aircraft and he was a lead on this project and this article just came out yesterday. So then with a quick text, I'm like, hey, did you know anything about this? He's like, yeah, I'm the one who led that whole effort. So he gets to do, he gets to travel all around the world and uh, see Stinger missiles, shoot these things down, now lasers, all sorts of cool stuff.
Perfect. So one of the applications that I work with the most um, throughout the four years working with the university is this mapping side of things. Um, there's a lot of different industries where mapping with UAS fits into other than what I have on this slide, but um, one of the projects that I've worked on is with the Department of Entomology here, figuring out how unmanned aircrafts can uh, be used practically uh, to help identify invasive species. We're coming up with some really uh, cool techniques that are kind of out of the box, and I'm excited once that work uh, gets published out there. Um, but we range from, uh, yeah, mapping huge fields to mapping little small research sections, and that's where um, most of the application for a thing like this is going to be something where it's a small research plot. Because this thing can only fly for the high accuracy mapping side of things. Um, I've been able to do some work and I can pull up, I brought some examples with me that I can show if you guys are interested after the presentation, uh, where we uh, did a high accuracy map um, over here by Manhattan of a water drainage experiment, a long-term water drainage experiment led by Nathan Nelson, I think is involved in all that. Um, but we mapped this area to, I think the ground resolution was right at uh, two centimeters. So it's about an 80 acre field uh, mapped at two centimeters and then we surveyed in ground control throughout this area uh, to give it really precise X, Y, and Z throughout the whole model and I think our ending Z, our, our worst accuracy out of all of it was about three and a half centimeters is what was reported on there. So some really, really precise stuff of what you can do with this and that, that's what I what I get a lot of fun out of. And that's also where volumetric side of things can come into. We actually got a call from um, one of the concrete companies around <coughs> here, and one of the things that they have to do is inventory at the end of the year how much stockpile they have. And conventionally, a lot of piles like this, um, whether it's coal piles, uh, rock piles, anything that you pile up, uh, if they were wanting precise measurements of it, you got to send a guy, survey crew, and they got to survey points around it, and maybe they even climb up on top of it, but that's really risky because the pile could break apart, they could slide off, so it's just not a very efficient way to do it. And you're only capturing one point at a time going across the whole area. And what actually prompted that uh, precision elevation study was one of my buddies was working as a student worker for the guy, and he was using survey equipment, measuring one point at a time. He could maybe capture, I don't know, a few hundred points in a day or something like that, where we spent about an hour mapping the area, uh, put it through some processing software, and that w way we were able to generate a point cloud of, I think there was about 200 million points in that point cloud. So, and each one of those points is accurate to around four centimeters. So that's a lot more efficient way to get accurate data of something. So, so uh, the order I'm kind of going to give this is list kind of an application and then talk about a limitation. So one of the biggest limitations to this technology ever since I started working with it is the legal side of things. Uh, it's really an interesting thing because the FAA or the Federal Aviation Administration is tasked with um, preserving the safety of our airspace. Um, the way they've conventionally done that ever since people started flying airplanes is they would regulate after a catastrophe. So after a plane would crash, they'd figure out what went wrong and then inevitably a rule would come out of why to fix that from, to keep people from dying. Um, with unmanned aircraft, there hasn't been any catastrophes yet. So it's all proactive regulation, which can be really frustrating for an industry because they're wanting to go out and do more things with it. Um, but the FAA, again, is tasked with maintaining safety. So it's a weird kind of time that we live in with a regulatory body like that, that they're trying to be proactive in regulating. So they're almost ultra cautious where you could probably go out and do more. But there's some exciting studies being done out there like uh, my former boss that works now at Virginia Tech, they were flying uh, drones into crash test dummies to uh, check the impact forces and actually get a case for, okay, how bad would it be if a drone would actually fly into somebody's face? 
and getting all the science behind that because nobody's done it before. Um, and then there's other major limitations to the legal side of things. Like I've stated before, beyond visual line of sight, that's a huge thing. Right now, you can't commercially fly an aircraft beyond where you can see it. You can ask for exemptions to do it for research, and you can have a chase airplane go and fly it. Like most articles out there, if you see what such and such company flies beyond line of sight, I'll read the fine print because they probably had a chase aircraft with it. So it's not <coughs> really beyond line of sight. Or they had visual observers stationed along the ground. So it's probably really not beyond visual line of sight again. The only people that are doing that really is the military. So uh, once that case gets established, then you'll see even more uh, application of this technology, specifically for like um, linear infrastructure, pipelines, power lines, things like that. Then operations over people, uh, which is going to be an interesting thing, I think, with this next video. So uh, if any of you follow, um, this guy's a popular YouTube guy, Casey Nysat. Anybody familiar with him around here? So here's a video that he did uh, with the eclipse. Video when I went to see the total lunar, no, total solar eclipse. It was amazing. But a lot of people have been asking, how did no, I shoot total solar eclipse? It was amazing. But a lot of people have been asking, how did I shoot the actual scene when the eclipse happened? Because I had a lot of coverage, so I thought I would explain. <laughs> First, you should know I had five cameras shooting simultaneously while the eclipse took place. Two of those cameras were flying cameras. First, the perfect overhead shot. About five minutes before the eclipse took place, I sent a Phantom 4 like this, straight up in the air, about 1,500 feet above the ground where I was standing. Camera pointed straight down like this. Then I set the location to lock so it wouldn't move too much, and I hit record. And then I just kind of forgot about it. Second camera, the one. Uh, with an I'm an aircraft and flying commercially means you fly with the intent to make money so this guy is a youtuber he makes money off the ads that he sells before his videos so he's definitely making this video to make money off of so he needs a license uh, you can't fly above 400 feet um, and you always have to maintain visual line of sight of it and then there's also this one thing uh, in FAA regulations that the FAA always dings people with is operating an aircraft in a careless and reckless manner. <laughs> so, um, I think he kind of hits all three right there. But, it's an interesting side of things with unmanned aircraft right now. So many people have these uh, that the FAA can't really enforce the regulations at all. Uh, so it makes it frustrating for people who want to do it the right way um, because there's tons of people out. This guy has, I don't know how many million subscribers this video has millions of hits, admitting to doing everything wrong and making money doing it. And it, he'll probably never see any enforcement action through it. So where, again, my journalist side of things, when I get into uh, law and those side of things, I'm like, why, why have regulations that aren't enforced? Because then it leads to arbitrary like interpretation of it, leads to only enforcing regulations on certain people. Um, and really, the FAA has only had one enforcement action against a company operating UAS. And that was a company that was flying uh, for promotional services, flying for movies and things like that. But they were flying <coughs> in cities like um, New York and LA, right next to the busy airports. And again, initially, the fine was like 1.4 million. And then, they, so, then every time uh, you get fined by the FAA, you get a chance to respond. And, make a case for yourselves. And then it got dropped to 200,000. So that's only one enforcement action over this uh, set of regulations that have been out for a little over a year. So personally, I'd like to see more enforcement actions put out there, uh, especially when people are admitting to doing it on the internet. So another good practical application of unmanned aircraft is inspection. And this is stuff where I ha I've had a lot of fun to be able to work with. Um, I've worked uh, a lot with an electric utility company where we've gone out and uh, looked at wind turbine blades, seen damage as much as uh, lightning damage, bird strikes, delamination of the actual blades. Uh, you can see a lot 
fly in something like this. Um, and that way, uh, you can, and really when it comes to inspections, it's more like getting the case for, okay, what's happening on this structure, and then determining if you gotta pay somebody to go out and fix something. Because conventionally, right now, we've worked with a company, like with cell phone towers and things like that. They have to send the crew out to climb up it, to look at it, to see if everything's good. And then if it's not good, then they have to climb back down, come out another time to fix all of it. So really, this kind of saves a trip for that company where you can pay a UAS operator probably a lot less just to fly the thing up there and take some pictures of it and get an idea of what's going on. Same case to the undersides of bridges. I didn't realize that this was such a complex problem, but it makes complete sense. Uh, you get a large bridge spanning over an area where you can't stand on the ground. Even with binoculars from the ground, you can't get a good idea of what's happening. So they actually have to shut down a lane and use one of these huge trucks uh, that uh, brings a guy over to where you're physically actually looking um, at the underside of a bridge. Perfect application. They make systems like larger than this, but with the camera mounted on top of it, where you can control that camera around, fly it right next to the structure and get an idea of what's going on. Uh, acid inventory, that's a perfect one. Again, kind of with the cell phone towers and things like that, get an idea of what's all there. Um, same thing applies to electric utilities, people like that. And the other fun one that I was able to participate in, uh, I was able to go to Jeffrey Energy Center, which is um, pretty close here to Manhattan. They were doing maintenance on one of their coal boilers. They went and cleaned it all out, uh, which a coal boiler is just a fascinating thing. It's a huge, giant metal box that usually houses a huge fireball the whole time. And then I was able to go in there and stand in the middle of it and look around. It's just kind of a weird, eerie thing being in a huge metal box like that. But anyways, a good application for flying an unmanned aircraft like this, because that way we didn't even really need to stand in there. You could have put this through the little porthole, fly it around in there, look at the actual blowers, which are what shoot out the coal dust, and be able to have a uh, damage assessment on those. Because if they get pointed the wrong way into the fireball, they'll actually melt. Um, so another perfect application for them. So uh, another limitation to that, and kind of sees more merit um, when you're talking about inspecting infrastructure, because you're usually flying pretty close to it. But also applies to the beyond line of sight side of things and also to the overall expansion of unmanned aircraft operations in the national airspace, which is uh, sense and avoid. So sense and avoid is another one of those legal mandates and um, uh, aviation regulations, is that as a pilot, you are tasked to see and avoid other aircraft. So I'm also a manned aircraft pilot. I have my private pilot's license and uh, instrument rating. So going through all that, when I'm flying in an airplane, I have to always be looking out and making sure I don't crash into anybody. Well, you can't do that if you're not actually on the aircraft. So that way you have to have technology come in to play that role. So where systems like this, where they have visual positioning sensors in front of it, that tells you how far away you are from an object. Um, systems to where you're actually able to communicate with other aircraft. Um, to have that uh, and all sorts of other different suites. I was actually able to work on a project this past summer um, that was more along the lines of the beyond line of sight operations, but um, another company, MITRE, which is a research organization, came alongside and said, hey, can we come along too? Because we I was up flying a manned aircraft, and then there was uh, research experiments going on on the ground, and we were flying the manned aircraft as an intruder. So the core experiment was testing people's reactions to uh, what they would do if they had a manned aircraft come in and fly into their airspace, which I've had happen plenty of times flying these things out, and especially um, flying uh, agriculture type stuff. I have crop, I've had probably about 10 close encounters with crop dusters. One to the point where I actually have a shadow of the crop duster in one of the images I was taking. He was so close to me. Um, so testing people's reactions. The MITRE was actually testing sense and avoid technology. Uh, one company they brought in using an acoustic uh, sensor to be able to track the acoustic signature of an incoming aircraft 
to be able to tell its direction and trajectory and all that. The other one was all uh, visual based. So it was just a camera pointed forward doing change detection and detecting if anything and that scene was changing. And they both uh, had great results. So eventually on systems that are gonna fly beyond line of sight, um, are gonna have some sort of combination of a bunch of different technologies to be able to see and avoid other aircraft, uh, not only other unmanned aircraft, but manned aircraft, buildings, people, all sorts of stuff like that. So, so the next thing uh, is uh, delivery of different items. So Amazon, good PR stunt back uh, two or so years ago during 60 Minutes, right before uh, Black Friday. It was very strategic of them to say that they were going to deliver packages by drone. Um, they're doing quite a lot. Uh, Google is as well. Uh, like I said, my boss, my former boss who works at Virginia Tech now, he was able to participate in the project where Google was partnered with Virginia Tech, who's partnering with Chipotle to deliver uh, burritos. Which, I was like, okay, really? But then I talked to my, uh, my boss and uh, he's like, no, listen to me, it makes sense. It, it's a delicate thing to be able to transport. So you can't like just smash it into the ground because somebody still wants to eat it. You gotta deliver it in a timely fashion because you still want it to be warm and all that. And it's a pretty decent sized payload, so it's about a couple pounds or whatever, or a pound. Um, so I was like, okay, okay, you, you convinced me that makes sense, but uh, it's still funny. Um, but I see the biggest practical application to delivery is um, with delivering medical supplies. That's where uh, this company, Zipline, is doing some really cool work. Yeah, when I heard of that company, I thought, that is just absolutely incredible because it makes perfect sense. These systems can't carry a whole lot of weight. So something like uh, blood or a vaccine or um, anything small that is incredibly dependent on saving somebody's life makes perfect sense to be able to deliver by, by an unmanned aircraft. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for those countries too. Um, undeveloped countries, they don't have the assets to be able to develop a road infrastructure like what we have. Um, and they don't have that much uh, activity in their airspace, so it's perfect. They can fly these things, they don't really have to worry too much about regulations, and the cost is still on the same side as if they would purchase a fleet of vehicles. So they can do that, use an unmanned aircraft and deliver things way faster, more efficiently, and ultimately save lives. So. Pretty cool. But that gets me to a thing. They said 15 minutes. Uh, usually I work in the terms of with multi-rotors or things like this that have multiple rotors, um, usually about 30 minutes. That's typical. For something that is gonna be cost effective for you, uh, you're about 
no matter the size of the platform, it's going to be about 30 minutes of flying. For a fixed wing, it's typically going to be about an hour, an hour to two hours. Um, even for like a helicopter, uh, that's going to be 55 pounds or under, you're still talking an hour to two hours, maybe three. Um, but uh, there are things that are improving. Uh, this aircraft, made by a company called Silent Falcon, um, is an electric aircraft, but it uses um, solar panels on the wings, and it can fly for five hours on, on one battery. Uh, fly for, and depending on the communication links you have with it, up to 100 kilometers away. So, uh, But battery life is just a huge hindrance to this. The batteries that are running on here are lithium polymer batteries, just like the ones in your phones. Uh, the ones I typically use are about 10 times the size of the one that's in your phone. Um, but the same sort of problems that happen with those, they um, don't last all that long. They have a short uh, cycle lifetime to where they go bad in about a year or two. Uh, they're also dangerous, just like those Samsung phones exploding. <laughs> These have a, more safety features built into it, but I, I have seen a couple of them get really close where we've uh, discharged a battery too far, and they've come close to catching on fire. Um, so whoever develops a better battery is going to uh, make a lot of money. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, there's also tethering for things where you just want to fly something like this. Uh, straight up in the air and just hover, which would be perfect for, I don't know, a news event. Um, there's a senior project that uh, some students are wanting to do that just put floodlights on the thing to where it can just pop up and illuminate an area. There you can actually just tether it, tether the power, um, just have a power cable running straight up with it. Um, that helps with endurance. Hybrids, kind of like I showed um, with the Google platform, where it is a multi-rotor, um, to allow it to take off vertically and then converts to a fixed wing to be able to fly forward and be able to get up to that hour, two hour endurance. Um, and then alternative fuel, there's some cool stuff happening there where I've been to some conferences using a hydrogen, not hydrogen, yeah, I think hydrogen fuel cell type things. Um, I think some biofuels, I've seen that as well. But some cool applications to help with endurance. So one of the last things, and I just like to include this, uh, this guy in each one of my presentations. If you want to, if you have an afternoon to watch some really cool videos on what robotics can do, uh, this guy is absolutely phenomenal in his lab. I think it's in Zurich, um, but I'll play this short video that um, I saw his first video back in 2013 when I started with these, and it was incredible even what they did back then. So they're in a netted area where they have all sorts of sensors around, of course, but, and they're able to keep track of these aircraft by the little ping pong balls that are on them. But They've written the code and algorithms to be able to have those aircraft automatically uh, play catch with each other, essentially. And it's funny, if you watch, it looks like they get frustrated when they miss. <laughs> so. This lab does all sorts of other cool stuff where um, they're developing the algorithms that are probably being sold to the companies like Intel that are using these things for coordinated light shows um, and all sorts of other things like that. But so some takeaways. Um, at the ARC, we are involved with all sorts of different type of stuff, um, and that's why I really enjoy it. Um, everything ranging from working with electric utilities to working with insects to working with um, the history department. Uh, so we've done things where we mapped uh, an old town um, that um, pretty much was off the face of the map and able to go in there. With, 
It was semi-successful because it was a densely wooded area, so we weren't able to get a lot of features out of it. But the concept of being able to um, capture like archaeological sites where you're wanting to preserve um, some history from what's on the ground, uh, another perfect application where it's fairly, fairly cost-effective to be able to go in and do that. Um, then my little plug, think when you say drone, just be aware of the language that you're using and where drone comes from. And when you say drone, I say drone just to speak to the general term of all these different things. But when I'm getting technical, it's unmanned aircraft, multi-rotor, fixed wing platforms, aircraft, things like that. Um, applications are endless with these things. Uh, and as you've seen throughout all these videos, we got a range of mapping coal piles to saving lives, delivering blood. Uh, to all sorts of stuff. So, and the limitations are lessening, they're still there. Um, actually, the US and Australia are probably the best climates for operating these things commercially. Um, why, one of the, the entomology project I work on is in cooperation with an Australian university, so I'm always talking with them, seeing how they're, how they're doing what they're doing. And those, those two countries are doing pretty good. Uh, a good friend of mine that uh, worked here at K-State um, moved to um, the Netherlands, and regulations in Europe are terrible. He can't hardly do anything commercially there. Um, so it's actually a unique time in the U.S. where the U.S. actually has a fairly business-friendly um, regulatory environment, at least for this technology. Um, so yeah, the limitations are less needed. Technology keeps getting better. Something like this would not uh, wasn't around when I was in school. We have a quadcopter like this um, that was around. They first got it in 2013. Um, it operated great. It had all sorts of code in it to where it helped tell you it fight wind and tell you how much battery it needed to be able to come home. Um, it was ruggedized and all that. It was also a hundred thousand um, dollars. Now, you can buy this off the internet for a thousand bucks that does a lot of those same things. It's not really ruggedized. Um, but even this technology has um, visual tracking in it to where you can click on a person and it'll follow them around. Um, where you don't need any external sensors or anything, you just, it just maps to the signature of that person. I'm like, that's missile guidance technology on a thousand dollar consumer product. This is just fascinating. So, uh, yeah, limitations are lessening. It's getting better. And uh, it's a fun industry to work in and pay attention to. So that's all I got um, to talk about so far today. So if anybody has any questions or if you want to come up and <coughs> talk more detail, again, I'm the data guy. So and I teach a three-day data course, so I can talk about data all day long, but I figured I'd have a presentation with a little bit of videos and just kind of give a high-level picture, and hopefully you guys walk away with uh, learning something more. So if anybody has any questions, can open it up. Yes? Do you see these being applied to something like video games? Absolutely. Good point. So I've done a lot of flight training with people, um, and the best people that pick up this are the ones that have played video games ever since they were a little kid. Um, so when it gets kind of like in video games, virtual reality, those sort of things, absolutely. Uh, this company makes a headset that you can wear um, to where it has head tracking and movement tracking to where as you move your head, it'll actually control that camera on there. Um, with the mapping side of things, uh, the things that I'm used to working with where it creates point clouds and 3D meshes, that's exactly the same type of data they work with to build video game maps. So I can see this technology being able to map a place, um, import that data into a video game or some sort of virtual reality, and maybe use that to train people in a certain situation where it's like the actual place. Um, I see applications like that going on. So, yeah. Yeah. So Trevor, who, who is providing these commercial UAS services? Yeah. You know, if, if Westar wants to contract somebody to do some inspections, are these small companies or are large consulting firms seeing dollar signs and incorporating this new technology into their yeah. existing businesses or a combination of yeah. both? Yeah, it, it's a complete combination and great 
Great question. And when I was in uh, school, I actually started my own business uh, to offer uh, photography services with these. And I still do a little bit of consulting work, but I've seen the wide range to where you got single person operators that um, make the investment and purchase one of these and they sell their services to go out. Um, and then I've seen companies um, that work off the franchise method to where they've got the big name and then they uh, contract with pilots all across the country that carry their name. Um, I've seen, and then uh, there's other large scale companies out there that um, have a, just a hefty crew of pilots that go out and contract and fly around all over the place. We are gonna work with the company um, to do disaster relief over in Florida but they had all their contracts lined up on the on the East Coast, and it hit mostly on the West Coast. So we didn't. It, we weren't. I actually probably wouldn't have been able to present today if we <laughs> we probably wouldn't have been out there still mapping. But, but yeah, a wide range, and it's interesting to see these businesses develop because commercial regulations to operate these actual regulations have only been around for about a year. Uh, there was an exemption method there for a year before. So really, we've only seen about two, three years of this being a commercial uh, operation. So the, any business that says they're an expert, they're really still an infant because uh, a lot's being learned and the technology is growing so much that it's really hard to be an absolute expert in this field quite yet. So. Oh, cool. So with a small UAS, what it, what's the payload capacity? Small. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, with a multi-rotor, uh, multi-rotors are um, the most inhibited by carrying weight. Uh, something like this. I mean, it's this thing still only flies for about 30 minutes, and that's the payload on it, uh, which is maybe a few ounces. Um, a platform as large as uh, we have one that has max takeoff weight of around, uh, I think it's 11 kilograms, and its payload capacity is about 5 kilograms. So not that much, and still you're talking only 30, 20 minutes of flight time, so not a whole lot. Um, the helicopters are probably the best ones with regards to carrying weight and still maintaining an hour of endurance. There's a helicopter. I know of that can carry, I think it's a, you know, like a 15 pound payload and still be able to fly for about an hour, so. So most of the sense, I think of imaging sensors, these smaller systems really are, are limited to carrying passive sensors? Yeah. yeah, correct. So consumer grade cameras, point and shoot cameras is mostly what I work with. Um, that's where Using those, you can still collect a lot of data with, like the precision elevation study. Um, that used just a regular RGB Sony camera, um, but the software used to process through all of it, and the structure from motion software, that's what really enables you to be able to use the $500 camera to create um, really accurate data um, in combination with survey equipment and all that. But now, one thing that we're interested in working with, and that we have a grant in the process, and we'll hear back this month, uh, so I'm, I'm waiting in anticipation with the National Institute of Justice, is to use a UAS-mounted LIDAR uh, system for crime scene mapping and clandestine grave detection. So, uh, UAS-mounted LIDAR is a hot topic right now um, because I don't know, everybody's like really excited about it and everybody's always been really excited about LiDAR um, and getting it onto a small platform like that, but it's an interesting cost difference with all of it. You can have a consumer grade camera that costs $500 mm -hmm. and still be able to produce really accurate data. Um, or the small sets of use cases to operate LiDAR, which are like flying at night, um, trying to get through a canopy of some sort, um, and there's a few others in there, but then you make the jump to $40,000 all the way up to $300,000. Um, so it's a hard case to be like, okay, we can just, we can, we can deal with just the visual imagery working with that. But with um, crime scene mapping and things like that, that's where 
you want to be able to map the scene as soon as you get there and everything's established. So that could be at night, that could be at any time, so that's a case to use LiDAR. So. Yeah, and the forest, yeah, all that. So hopefully, I'm hoping we get that so I'm able to answer that question even better, hopefully in a year, so, yeah. Um, do you ever test them during bad weather? Because I notice a lot of them, it's nice weather. Yep, so. yeah, so Max wins with these things. Uh, I, anything above, so 15 to 20, it starts getting interesting. 20 to 25, it's hard. Anything above 25, you're not you're not going to fly, um, because it, it takes up so much battery from there that it doesn't even make sense to go out and fly. Flying in rain and things like that, most of these systems have exposed um, electric motors on them, so you're probably not going to fly in any sort of um, precipitation. But there are um, uh, protected systems that are ruggedized that can fly fly in moisture. So, so yeah. It pretty much you need perfect days, good perfect days to be able to fly these things, which doesn't happen all the time. Well, we're a little bit over time, but I'd like to for everyone to, to thank Trevor. Perhaps he's got a, a few moments afterwards if anyone yep, has I any do. Other, other questions. Thank you, Trevor. Appreciate yep, absolutely. It. Thanks.